Good evening, everyone. I welcome all our speakers and our audience for today's webinar on the topic, Tools to Improve Profitability in Spinning Mills Using Cotton USA Solutions. Today's webinar is brought to you by Cotton Council International in partnership with the Textile Magazine. By default, the mic and the webcam of all the attending audience would be on mute. And, uh, but if you have any specific questions, please use the chat window to post your question and also to the speaker to whom you would like to address it to. Your questions would be answered at the end of the webinar. If not, if time doesn't permit, then the speakers will directly reply to your questions to your mail ID. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker for today's session, Mr. Piyush Naram. He represents Cotton Council International for Indian and Sri Lankan markets. He would be giving a short introduction about his company and also the rest of the speakers for today's session. Hello, Piyush, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Ganesh. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope you are keeping safe. Welcome to Cotton US Solutions webinar. The topic of our today's webinar is tools to improve profitability in spinning mills. While we all have been witnessing these turbulent times, the Indian textile industry has shown strong resilience. One of the reasons is the passion of our people in the textile industry, who continues to strive to always do better. And in your endeavor to do better, you can always consider Cotton USA as your long trusted partner. Spinning in India is well established and very deeply rooted. Then why do we really need experts? At times, we all need new eyes to look at things, to bring in the new perspective, and there's always a scope of improvisation. That's the reason that US cotton industry now has a team of experts in our new cotton consultancy, Cotton USA Solutions. We take pride in saying that our team of experts have unmatched global perspective as they have an experience of working with more than 1,500 mills spread across more than 50 countries. Cotton USA Solution Program is taking the mills and manufacturers to a next level of success as our experts use the latest technique with their unmatched experience. So this, this solutions program offer mill studies, mill exchange program, technical seminars, webinars, Cotton USA Mill Mastery course, and our flagship program, one-to-one -one mill consult, which happens both physically and virtually, as we are using these new technologies like polar lens in these challenging times, as it is getting more and more difficult to travel. So all these services are complementary for our cotton US sales who are also members of US Cotton Trust Protocol. The US Cotton Trust Protocol is a new sustainability platform, which has already been joined by more than 400 manufacturers and 30 global brand and retailers. As we speak, in India, we now already have 25 mills manufacturers who have joined the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. And we have started this program only six months back. So U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol has set the new standards that brings quantifiable and verifiable goals and measurement to more sustainable cotton production that drives continuous improvement in key sustainability metrics like water usage, energy savings, greenhouse gas emissions, and soil carbon. The program addresses the need of the science-based goals the program is supported by a strong protocol credit management system that gives much needed transparency and technical assurances to brand and retailers. That the cotton fiber that they have in the supply chain has no labor or any involvement in this program. So before we start our webinar, I will request Ganesh to put our first question on the board because we would like to understand more about the participants. So you would see the first question on your screen now. So Ganesh, if you can put our first question on the screen, please. Ganesh, hope you are able to hear me now. Okay, I think uh, uh, you should be able to do that soon. And uh, before he does it, I, I can also introduce uh, you to our agenda. So our first speaker is Mr. Chris Fieber. He's going to speak on the topic fiber selection. Cotton being a natural product, it poses new challenges every year as we have a new crop each season. The selection of the fiber can change the fortune of the mills. I'm very glad to have Chris with us. He was scheduled to visit India last month, but unfortunately he had to cancel the trip last moment. So please allow me to introduce Chris today. So Chris holds a degree of mechanical engineering from the University of Applied Sciences in Krefield, Germany. With 33 years of experience, he has worked for leading European machinery suppliers to the global spinning sector. 
deeply rooted in research and development. He has held various managerial positions in research and development at, at Scalafords, Wooster and Schuzler for almost 20 years, working and living in Germany, the USA, and Switzerland, and has worked in major textile hubs on all these continents. Grace has authored an impressive number of technical and scientific publications throughout his career and has been a speaker at many international forums. He is listed as an inventor on a multitude of patents. His field of expertise covers cotton spinning technology from field to fabric with an emphasis on spinning and researching the relationship between cotton fiber properties and yarn quality parameters, as well as mill and downstream processing performance. Grace joined the CCI technical team in December 2020 in the role of technical consultant, thanks to his vast knowledge, extensive experience, and global professional network. So now over to you, Chris. I won't hold you much longer. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hey, Yush. Thank, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, I hope that everybody can see my screen now. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And greetings from too cold and rainy Germany for late May. But it's a pleasure for me to speak to you about cotton fiber selection, the latest addition to the Mill Mastery Courses program. Table of contents, very quickly. First of all, a couple of slides on Cotton USA solutions. I'm going to be introducing five exceptional services from CCI for users of US cotton. Next is the Mill Mastery Courses, which is one of the five building blocks that I'm going to quickly introduce. Then the important part of this presentation, fiber selection, the latest Mill Mastery course as requested by our customers. And last but not least, a quick summary. Cotton USA Solutions. Very quickly, what is that? It's basically five service offerings from CCI meant to make our customers' business more profitable. And that consists on, of one-on-one -on -one mill, mill consults, mill studies, mill exchange, technical seminars, and the mill mastery courses. Now, you'll see a video of this here in a minute, but let me tell you, it's complimentary. This is totally free to you if you are a qualified Cotton USA licensee and a USCTP member. So here's the video. If you're looking for greater profitability, improved productivity, and the latest techniques, look to the cutting edge in cotton. Cotton USA Solutions. This new cotton consultancy was created to take mills and manufacturers to the next level of success with a team of experts who provide an unmatched global perspective. Informed by our work with over 1,500 mills in 50 plus countries, our offerings can be in person or virtual and are complementary for licensees, starting with mill studies. This collection of research is based on third-party, controlled in-mill testing and provides hard data to build your business, like new spinning protocols that increased ring frame productivity over 8%, blend insights, and more. Next is the Mill Exchange program that lets you exchange ideas with mill executives from around the world. You'll tour licensee signature mills and share proven techniques in cotton yarn processing. Cotton USA Solutions also offers technical seminars. They provide training in buying, spinning, handling, and more using the latest US cotton techniques from across the supply chain. Next, our Mill Mastery course, where you can gain a new level of expertise with a comprehensive course of study from raw cotton to bale management to quality control to make you a true spinning master. Finally, there are one-on-one -on -one mill consults offering you customized consulting services for proven cost savings from 10 to 25%. Cotton USA Solutions. With Mill Studies, our Mill Exchange Program, Technical Seminars, Mill Mastery Course, and one-on-one -on -one Mill Consults, we're here to take your business to the next level. Learn more at cottonusa.org solutions or contact your representative. Cotton USA Solutions.
Okay. If you're looking. So one of the five building blocks that I have just introduced via the video is the Mill Mastery Courses. How does that work? A Mill Mastery Course consists of a, a member of our technical team coming to your mill to conduct a Mill Mastery Course on a subject of your choice according to your specific needs. We have a comprehensive collection of, of courses, including 17 modules with over 2,000 slides covering everything you need to know in cotton spinning. So from fiber to bale, this is about cotton growing and cotton harvesting, fiber quality, cotton fiber trading and buying, fiber selection, that's the new module. We have a thing on bale management and opening and cleaning, carding, drawing, combing, roving, ring spinning, rotor spinning, winding, doubling on twisting. We have a, a course on, on maintenance, which in, includes ambient conditions, ambient conditions, opening and cleaning, carding, drawing, lap winding, combing, rotor spinning. And mm, economical things like uh, financial things like the, e the economics of, of spinning, economic benefits of different spinning systems, the architecture of a signature mill, a collection of case studies, and a course on profitability. So the latest edition is on fiber selection. The latest addition to the mill mastery courses is on fiber selection. Now, at CCI, most of what we do actually comes from listening to our customers. And several customers, customers have been asking us for a recipe book, which is a, um, a precise instruction as to what fiber properties to select for a given application. So the fiber selection recipe book that emanated from this request is a detailed description of US cotton HVI fiber properties that are re recommended for certain end uses. These recommendations consist of a mean value and a mean. And that information can really, really be used in cotton buying and for bale management. But there are also some limitations to these recommendations. First of all, all all that's going to be presented in the framework of um, the fiber selection module pertains to 100% US virgin cotton only. No mix of cotton origins, no man-made fiber blends. The percentage and the composition of reusable waste or recycled material is not considered. No extra long staple. Therefore, sixes to 242s carded and 20s to 50s combed. Air jet spinning is not considered. And the yarn end uses are confined to knitting and weaving for apparel and home furnishings. So no technical, industrial, or specialty applications. And last but not least, the quality level that the recommendations correspond to is roughly 25% user statistics. So let's get right into it. This is an example of, um, of a recipe for, for 30s carded for knitting and the knitted fabrics to be dyed to, to dark shades. Actually, 30s is the most common count, but it's more appropriate to use a range here from 28s, from 28s to 32s. I have used this, this example because it is a classic worst case scenario with respect to the, the omnipresent bar ray, die streaks, die shape, and white specs problems. The proper fiber selection is the problems. Now, the structure of the table very much resembles the USDA form R which is a summary spreadsheet of single bale HVR properties. The columns are official color grade, the grade itself and the minimum maximum. Staple lengths given in 30 seconds, 
pounds, in fractions, in inches, and millimeters, whatever you, you can relate most to. Micronair, along with the maximum and minimum. Strength in grams per tex, maximum, minimum. HDI grade, the corresponding maximum, minimum. Leaf grade, extraneous matter or remarks. The RD reflectance, the plus B yellowness, HVI trash area, and uniformity. And in terms of the lines, we have recommendations for conventional ring spinning, compact spinning, and rotor spinning. So let's start with the color grade, the official color grade. What we recommend for 30s carded knitting dye to dark color is a color grade of 2131, right borderline 2131, which is a middling, strict middling white grade. And that is true for all three spinning, uh, spinning systems. The maximum should be a 41 and the minimum should be an 11. So you could use 11, 21, 31, and 41 in the mix and get appropriate results. Next is the length. Given in, in, in several um, expressions here, what we recommend for ring 30 is carded for knitting is a 36 staple for ring conventional. On compact, this is important now, we recommend a 35 staple because you can actually save on the raw material cost due to the better overall quality of compact yarns versus conventional ring spun yarns. But if you would like to, to benefit from the better quality, just use the same staple length you would use on conventional ring that is 36. So it's up to you, a gain in quality or a reduction in cost. On rotor, a recommendation is 34 staple, 20, 27 millimeters, and no mins or maxes. Next, that is very important now for the things that I have um, addressed a minute ago to avoid bar ray dye streaks and, and white specks. You need to control micronair for conventional ring the recommendation is 4.8 average micronair with a range of 4.4 to 5.2. So very important, no bales below 4.4 micronair in the mix. Now with rotor spinning, this is a little bit different because due to the, the finest connection of the micronair value, and um, the number of fibers in the cross-section cross re required for rotor spinning, we recommend four point at the range of 4.2 to 4.8. I'm sorry. Okay, now, okay, what, what have I been, been, been talking about in, in conjunction with Micronair? It's fabric barre known to most people in the audience. And, and how it relates to, to micronair. Typical thing, no, high micronair, dark shade, low, low micronair, light shade, and the occurrence of white specks. Now, a white specks, you can, you, you can admire here, so it's, um, it's a SEM, SEM photograph, and actually these white specks consist of, of dead fibers, almost exclusively, not mature, not immature, but dead fibers. So that is why the micronair value is so important in controlling the mixes and the laydowns. Strength is next. 29 grams per text for conventional ring. You can lower it somewhat, save some cost by going down to 28 on the compact because the compact system is going to, to offset that. And open end, we also recommend 28 grams per tex. HVI grade, 
21, 31, as I've just talked about, going from 41, 3 to 11, 2 as the minimum maximum range for both ring and compact, and a little bit higher on the leaf grade for, for open end, because the open end can handle that higher trash very, very well. No extraneous matter, no remarks. We don't recommend any of that for this particular application, 30s, carded, knitting, dyed, dark color. RD, the reflectance, should also be tightly controlled. Our recommendations is, recommendation is 79% RD for, for all three spinning systems with a range of plus minus 2.5 here. Very important to maintain. Tying results, 8.2 for all three spinning systems with a range of, 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 of seven to nine point four. Trash here again, less trash on the ring spinning based systems, and we can afford some higher trash on on the open end spinning. Uniformity. This is this is again very very important because with U.S. upland cottons, it it, it relates directly to short fiber content. So our recommendation is 83 uniformity percent, we need 84 for ring. We can somewhat ease off on that for the compact spinning because it's, it, it provides better IPI and better uniformity. Um, so with this, you can save raw material cost. If you keep it the same as in conventional ring, you'll be gaining on quality. On rotor spinning, the target should be 80% uniformity index with a range of 79 to 81. So that was it, basically. Let me go back to the Cotton USA Solutions Program. So um, the fiber selection is, is part of the, of, of the Mill Mastery Courses and the Mill Mastery Courses is part of the Cotton USA Solutions Program. And, and all that was designed for just one single reason, to support our representative in servicing our Cotton USA licensees and our EOC2P members and to ultimately increase their profitability. So on behalf of the entire CCI tech team, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to all the questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I will presentation. Uh, and now, now may I, uh, we will have a lot of questions, but we will do and we uh, close your voice box so that we can move to the next session. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Pish. Thanks thank, a lot. Thank you. So before we go to our next, uh, session. May I request Ganesh again to put up our next polling question? And our next polling question for our participants is How much familiar are you with Cotton USA solutions? Are you very familiar? That's the first option. Are you somewhat familiar or are you completely unfamiliar with the Cotton USA solutions? So your options are your own screen. Please uh, respond to the polling question. Yeah, so now we will move on to our uh, next speaker. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Mohammed Pawsif. And uh, Chris, may I ask you to close your video, please, so that I can ask uh, Dr. Tosif to come forward, please. Hi, 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 Pushman. Yes, yes, hi, hi, Dr. Tosif. So Dr. Tosif is going to speak on the comparison of machine and hard and hand harvested cottons in the manufacturing of knit garments. We are very delighted to have Dr. Tosif with us today. So let us give a very brief introduction of Dr. Tosif because he's coming for the first time to the Indian Technical Seminar. So we will want to make a brief introduction about him. 
So Dr. Tausif joined Cotton USA Solutions team in January 2021 as a technical person. Dr. Tausif is also an associate professor in sustainable textile manufacturing and director of Cot postgraduate program at the University of Leeds. He is a fellow of Textile Institute. Prior to joining academia, he has worked in the textile manufacturing and R&D sector. He has an ongoing research collaboration with national and international textile industry. Since 2012, he has over 40 publications in the field of textile technology, including 24 peer-reviewed journal publications, both chapters and patents. He has also been a chapter speaker at numerous international conferences in the field of textiles. He holds a postgraduate certificate in academic practice. He completed his PhD in fiber processing and advanced structural characterization at the University of Leeds, UK. Prior to that, he completed BSc Textile Engineering with specialization in yarn manufacturing from National Textile University, Pakistan. His key research interests are various aspects of textile science and technology, including fiber testing and characterization, yarn manufacturing, structured property modeling of fibrous assemblies, development of sustainable and eco-friendly textile structures, and microfiber pollution from textiles and its mitigation. So that's a lot to, for us speakers to get in. So Dr. Tosse, over to you, please. Thank you very Thank much. You Can you see my screen? Okay. So good afternoon from Leeds in United Kingdom. I hope you and your loved ones are well and safe. And thank you, Pirish, for a very detailed introduction. So as we mentioned, I'm a technical consultant for Cotton Council International and separate my work for CCI. I'm a social professor in sustainable textile manufacturing at the University of Leeds. UK. So the topic of today's presentation, so we'll be looking at what is the impact of NAPS on quality and, prof and profitability from bale to t-shirt. And while we do that, we'll be looking at cotton from four different origins. Cotton Council International is the export promotion arm of the National Cotton Council in the United States. Every year, CCI sponsors projects carried out by independent third-party industry consultants, investigates aspects of U.S. upland cotton, which has been raised with us during visits to customers or during other events organized by CCI. So NEPs are fiber entanglements that have a hard detectable central knot, so, and they occur in all gin cotton. Any cotton you take, there will be naps in it. The quantity can vary, but there always be naps. If you want to classify naps, so they're pure fiber naps. So these are mechanical naps, which is a bundle of fibers and tangled together. Then we have seed coat naps. So the major difference in seed coat naps is that there is a biological contamination and matter, seed fragments in the middle, and then we have entangled fibers. And then biological are shiny naps, which Chris was showing an SCM earlier. So these are bundles of or clumps of immature fibers because they are very less cellulose, so they can't absorb dye, and they finally appear as white specks in the final uh, fabric appearance. So pure fiber naps are the ones which are most common in U.S. cotton, uh, but the more problematic are uh, seed coat naps and shiny naps. So one of the things which we come across is the high content of nets and short fibers, uh, which you can sometimes find in US upland cotton. So our objective was to look at the technical impact of all types of nets on carded and combed yarns, and subsequently process these yarns into dyed knitted garments, and then do a detailed technical and financial comparison. So while we were doing this, we thought it's, it's important to look at the input method and the ginning method in the, in, in the field before it is picked. There are virtually very, very few naps. If there are any, they would be biological or shiny naps. So naps start happening from harvesting and then ginning, and then they are increased in grow room, but they start decreasing uh, afterward. So we wanted to compare different methods of harvesting and different methods of ginning. So we decided to look at four cotton. So of course, United States cotton, Indian cotton, Brazilian cotton, and West African cotton. 
The study was conducted in India, uh, West African and Indian cottons are normally hand harvested, whereas US and Brazilian cottons are 100% machine picked. So Indian cottons are roller gen, while Brazilian West African cottons are, are saw gen. So as a general principle, uh, manually harvested cotton will have fewer naps than mechanically harvested cotton. And within mechanical harvesting, stripper harvested cotton will have slightly higher naps than the spindle harvested cotton because you need more pain. So sawgin cotton will have higher naps than the rolls of cotton. So these are the general principles. So we know that US cotton doesn't have the advantage there in that sense that it has higher naps because it is machine fit and is, is uh, sawgin. So we took this, this cotton. So the study, the yarn manufacturing took place at a large, well-established mills, producing high quality carded, com, uh, carded comb and compact link spun yarns. The process from knitting to the, to the garments were carried out upon the customers of the yarn manufacturers in India. The both mills were considered by our consultants to be the world-class operations. So normally, all of our projects are done by outside consultants, outside consultants through a tendering process. And this project was awarded to PT, Sirivijaya at Texas Solutions from Indonesia. And we know them very well for their high quality work. And we've been working with them for quite some time. The study was divided into two parts. As I mentioned earlier, a technical review as well as a financial review. So a technical review where consultants monitored every key stage of the manufacturing chain, from bale to the garment, so from bale to yarn, so within bale to yarn, each process step, and we collected quality data to quantify the process and performance of the four projects. The technical data directly informed financial comparison based on the cost data can be shared by the, uh, by the host uh, mills with the consultants. All the details were monitored by the team of consultants on site. Given the time constraint, I would only be emphasizing on KPIs, or key performance indicators, and not on the individual process step of each manufacturing process. So you can always reach out to us for more details. So the cotton compared in the study are normally used by the spinning mills, except the Brazilian cotton, which they specifically purchased for the purpose of this study. As we can expect, the nets per gram and short fiber content is higher in the three sawgen cottons compared to Shankar 6, which is hand-picked and rolling. So as we have earlier covered uh, about different types of naps and why there is more propensity of naps happening in certain bottoms and great bottoms. So in opening, cleaning, and carding, so results demonstrated that with the appropriate machine settings, the nap in the saw zone cotton were easily removed. Understandably, there was initial increase in naps count in the blue room followed by removal during, during carding. So if I show you the results on this slide of IPI of US cotton in both carded and combed yarn, you can see that US cotton in particular compared to the few other cotton demonstrated the lowest IPIs, both carded yarn as well as combed yarn. And the waste loss during blow room and carding was also lowest for the, for the EMOD US cotton. In the bottom right image, we can also see high level of trash and bark observed in Brazilian cotton. And this high level of bark we'll also see later on in the presentation also causes problems in further processing. So this slide showed you the, uh, shows you the initial trash content in the individual cottons. The overall cleaning efficiency from bale to card Sliver range from 93.25% US cotton to a low of 82.4% with Brazilian cotton. Similarly, the nap removal efficiency, so this is all types of naps uh, and the more tricky seed coat naps, was highest for, for US cotton uh, in terms of nap removal efficiency. With the same machine settings in combing, there was a significant difference in the noil percentages extracted from the cotton. As you've seen in the IPI results, the US cotton demonstrated lowest IPI despite the lowest percentage of compromise. And given that the initial high nap count in sawgen cottons, we can see that naps can be effectively mitigated during carding and combing of the cotton products. 
it is also evident that U.S. cotton has achieved highest highest reduction in short fiber content during processing. So, thirty single U.S. cotton carded yarn. The IPA results were remarkable. So, initially, after opening and cleaning, U.S. fiber had the highest nap count of the four cottons. But if you look at the final IPA of the, of the ring spun bobbin, you can see that U.S. had 143 IPA compared to 539 for the hand harvested prologen chunk of six, 288 for basin cotton, 194 for best effort. 30 single carded yarns. The U.S. cotton yarn results were mostly below the 5% curve of the 2008 statistics for carded yarns, while the Shankar 6 13 carded yarns were the equivalent of only 63% of those. So to reinforce both carded and combed U.S. cotton yarn results fall in less than 5% to standard category for almost all the yarn quality parameters. In winding, the clear cuts per 100 kilometer in all categories were lowest with the US EMO cotton than any of the other fibers in the state. And in terms of classmate test provides evidence, you can see in the chart, that the US EMO yarns performed significantly better than the competitors. In the ring frame, the performance of all four cottons in terms of end breaks per 1,000 spindle hours and EMO field based percentages were, were monitored. And as you see on this slide, the results here for both carded and combed yarn demonstrate that across the four cotton, the US cotton exhibits lowest number of end breaks and consequent lima field waste during the yarn spin. Finally, waste loss results. Obviously, with waste, our yield is important as raw material represents nearly 70% of the spinner's cost. So this study confirmed that in almost every aspect of yarn manufacturing, the machine harvested sawage and cottons outperformed that and were hand harvested origin cotton fiber. Uh, I cannot see you, but if you manage to stay awake, I appreciate because my students are using the SD by this time. So moving on to moving on to knitting, the fabric was single jersey, and the machine specification and fabric parameters are provided on the slide for your reference. And if, if you look at the knitting fabric results, the consultant monitored the performance of the machine used for the knitting trials. In terms of machine stops per roll of fabric produced, which was converted into stops per 100 kilograms of yarn for each of the four quarters. The results are given for both carded and combed yarns demonstrate the good performance of the US cotton. Expectedly, the breaks go further down for combed yarns with a similar trend for four cotton lines. Good. The consultants observed that the majority of stops were caused by yarn breaking on the cones or by fluff buildup in the slug catches on the machine. The majority of Brazilian cotton yarn eating stops were associated with the remnant trash present in the yarn. So if we can associate back to that slide and high level of bark trash, so that caused problem in the middle processing as well. The knitted undyed fabric was inspected using a four-point system based on the frequency and size of the defects. And the results in this table show you that fresh fabric inspection results for corded and combed yarn, which are expressed in 100 square yards of fabric, and then they convert it into 100 kilograms of knitted yarn. So you can see, again, US cotton is better performing compared to the rest of the cotton. So moving on to dyeing and finishing, the grayish fabric was divided. So half of it was bleached and rest half was divided into two shades. So half of the rest was in red and half was in a in navy blue shade. Navy blue shade is considered to be a relatively different, difficult color to, to dye. So we chose that. And the host mill employed airflow technology to dye all the fabrics. The dyed fabrics in all colors were examined using the four-point inspection system. And we also tested the fabrics in the laboratory for shrinkage, spirality, color fastness, and color differences for each, each of the three uh, time methods, uh, three fabrics that we have done. It's in different colors, white, navy, and black. So using the four-point system, 
So if there are any uh, sample shows more than 28 points per 100 square yards, it is degraded as a reject. And you would see in the table that none of the fabrics processed from any of the four cottons failed the inspection process in any color. However, the US cotton comparatively performed better among the four cotton types, as you can see in the results. So the research consultants then took 25 square centimeter samples from each fabric and manually counted the naps and the white spikes. And results in the table show that red and navy blue dyed samples, the US cotton fabric demonstrated eight times less naps than West African cotton in red shades and five times less naps than chunky cotton in navy blue shades. So it outperforms here as well. So as we have seen in results of yarn manufacturing and knitting, the results here shows as well that both in terms of fabric quality and impact of naps, the US cotton is performing well. So the testing on the fabrics in the, labo in the laboratory, all four fibers met the, uh, the host mills 5% spirality and shrinkage standards. And if you look at the individual data point, the US EMOT cotton produced comparatively better results in both of these tests. So the white test index results were all four cottons were good. And more importantly, there was no significant difference in the testing results for color process and the delta E value, the color difference value. So I would in particular emphasize on that uh, because sometimes we hear comments about dyeing of US cotton and this shows that the delta E, the color differences were very small. So they were always one or less which are not perceivable by human eyes. So there were very, very insignificant differences. In the, the US cotton does die very well. So we move to the next step, the garment manufacturing. T-shirts were produced from the white, navy blue, and red fabrics, all three types, and from all cotton types. And from the host mills manufacturer point of view, an important performance is cotton to garment realization process. And chart on this slide show you that cotton garment realization for carded yarns on the left and combed yarns on the right. And consultants commented that relatively poor results of resin cotton samples would be heavy fiber losses during yarn yarn manufacturing and knitting. So all the t-shirts which were produced during the trial were inspected again by normal quality standards and they were graded either pass, P grade, or a region. The chart on the left here shows you the percentage of carded yarn garments passed, and on the left and on the and on the right, the percentage of garment rejected for each of the four bottom You can see that US cotton demonstrated highest pass percentage and the lowest rejection percentage. And on this slide, you can see the charts for comb yarn which show the percentage of garments that achieve a pass reject level in all three colors. The consultants commented that hand harvested cotton contains high level of contamination in both carded and comb yarns. It is important to mention that none of the garments made of any of the four cottons were rejected are graded B for, for NAPS. These were other faults which, which the consultants observed. So after the completion of the technical comparison, the financial comparison was carried out. And it was informed by the technical comparison and the data from the host mills. And this chart shows you that the price paid by the host spinning mills for the four fibers, which was studied, in, which was studied. the domestic shunker cotton was the cheapest uh, and US upland cotton was expensive by eight cents per pound. With the cost debt of the two project partners, uh, the host mill, the research consultants also calculated the profit per garment profit per garment generated by each of the cottons in the study. And this slide plots the profit per garment for both carded and comb yarns. Uh, the exchange rate used was one US dollar equivalent to 74 Indian rupees. In both cases, you can see that the US cotton performs better than the counterpart. In comparing, so in summary, the price of the local Shunker 6 cotton, it may surprise uh, many members of the audience that despite the high entry cost of US up and cotton fiber in the spinning mill, US cotton 
which was eight cents per pound higher, can produce a garment that generates more profit per garment for the manufacturer. With carded yarn garments, the profitability gap between Chunker 6 and the EMOT US cotton was nine cents per garment. And this gap even grows wider in the common yarn, yarn garments where the US cotton garment is 22 cents advantage compared to US, uh, compared to uh, the other cotton. Independent research studies commissioned by CCI over the last three years. So in addition to this study, we have conducted previous studies and they are available on, on, on our website. And these studies consistently confirm that practice of many mills to buy their cotton based on price is a huge mistake. So you, if you're only looking at raw material cost, that's a huge mistake. You need to look at the whole process. You need to look at the final profitability margin and the processing performance. And this is again reinforced by this study, which we have done and presented now. So the study has confirmed, although and understandably, machine harvested sergeant, sergeant cottons have more nets and a higher short fiber content, then they're gently and harvested dologen uh, competitors. This had no negative impact on downstream processing or bottom line garment profitability. In this study, the hand harvested dologen cotton has been outperformed at every stage of processing and in parameters quantified by the research principle. Compared to other sojin cottons, the US cotton has also demonstrated clear technical advantages which translate into financial gain. From the CCI perspective, we are pleased that once again, third party independent research has confirmed superior performance of US cotton in yarn manufacturing and subsequent processing into knitting, dyeing finishing and carbon manufacturing. I thank you for your attention and I will be available to answer your questions in the QA session at the end. If you have Further queries, please feel free to reach me on mtoc at cotton.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tosif. That was a wonderful presentation. And honestly speaking, uh, you know, all our you know, friends in the Indian textile industry have been looking towards this research or study about the NEPs on US cotton. So I'm sure this will be able to you know, resolve so many queries that they had about the NEPs issues. So once again, thank you very much, Dr. Tosif. And now we request you to please uh, close your video and also, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Tosif. So before I move to the next speaker, I will want to announce the results that we got from our polling question. The polling question was, how familiar are you with cotton universal solutions? So the results that have come up is that 16% of the participants are very familiar with US cotton solutions. Around 48% are somewhat familiar with cotton USA solutions, and there are still 35% of the members who are not uh, familiar with cotton USA solutions. So I think we'll have to do our bit to increase the awareness about the cotton USA solutions within the industry. So before I actually go to our next speaker, I will want to add our next question, which is the third question for the polling. And may I request Ganesh to please put up the question to all our participants. And this is really very important for us to understand your opinion of this polling question. And the question is, how does the quality of US cotton compare to cotton from other regions of the world? So how does the quality of US cotton compare to the cotton from other regions of the world? The option one is US cotton quality is better than cotton from other regions. That's the first option. The second option is US cotton quality is about the same than cotton from other regions. And the third option is U.S. cotton quality is worse than cotton from other regions. So we will appreciate your response on that. Thank you. So yes, so let's go on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is Mr. Roger Bill Martin. I'm very glad to welcome Roger today. Although he's having little issues with the internet, I, I hope we will be able to help go ahead with that. And once again, uh, very welcome, Roger. And many of you would already know him from our previous sessions, but for our new participants, I will do a very quick introduction about Roger. In his 56 year uh, career in the textile industry, Roger has advised major companies, organizations, and governments in 56 different countries holding senior management and ownership positions in the industry. He has graduated from Bolton University in 1964 and quickly coming to his present uh, work, which is that he is running his own consulting firm, Tribe Blend Consulting. 
Roger is the founding member of Quantum USA Technical Services team, and he acts as a special advisor. He is a chartered textile technologist, vice president of Textile Institute, and has been an elected as a chairman designate of the Textile Institute Council. So this is a very quick brief. I don't want to go, you go into an elaborated direction. And now over to you, Roger. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, once again. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I hope you can hear me as... Uh, no, you can't hear me, can you? Am I muted? No, no, you're very well, able to hear you very well. Roger, oh, please okay. go ahead. Please okay, go ahead. sorry. Uh, as Poosh has said to me, um, I'm speaking to you today from my uh, home office in uh, rainy, overcast uh, Scotland, and that seems to be having some impact on my... Uh, uh, connectivity. So hopefully we'll get through this uh, uh, quite well. Um, I want to talk today to you about uh, the whole subject of uh, industrial engineering. Um, uh, over the last three and a half years, we've probably visited over 100 mills uh, in India and uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, all over Asia, Southeast Asia, and China. And one of the interesting things is that there seems to be uh, very little understanding uh, in the primary sector. And what we describe as the primary sector is spinning, knitting, uh, weaving, dyeing, and finishing. There seems to be very little understanding of how uh, the simple techniques that we're going to talk about today can have a positive impact on all those particular sectors. For some reason, my slide transfer is not working. Let me try again. Uh, yeah, Roger, please try. Yeah, to okay, find it's there. Sorry, sorry. Uh, can you see the next slide? Pathway to profitability? Yes, we can see that. Okay, the pathway good. to profitability. Okay. Yeah, um, I spent the uh, first 25 to 30 years of my career um, working in high labor cost countries. Uh, for example, in the uh, middle 70s to the middle of the 80s, I, I focused a lot of my career working in Italy, which at the time I would have considered to be uh, one of the best textile industries in the world. Even in those days, labor cost in Italy uh, was the equivalent of 30 to $35 an hour when you include social charges. So clearly, uh, those are things that, that make people in high-wage cost countries very, very conscious of labor costs. So it's in my particular DNA that every time I walk around any operation, I'm always looking at how uh, uh, costs could be reduced, profit could be increased, by focusing a little bit more on the subject of labor productivity. Um, so uh, really, uh, as I've said earlier, we believe that uh, industrial engineering techniques that we'll talk about today are the first stepping stones to more effective man management, lower labor costs, and all the other things that that will bring uh, to your mills. Um, I, uh, other people who've heard me speak before always uh, I've perhaps heard me say or use this phrase that cheap labor is a curse and uh, often leads to technical and organizational compl complacency, but it, it's the truth. When, when labor is very cheap, when you've got too many ends breaking in the ring frames or any other uh, subject that's going on in the mill, uh, the easiest uh, way to resolve those is just to put more people to attack the problem. But what that means is at the end of the day, it's very often that the root causes of problem are never identified or addressed. Um, so I want to talk a little bit uh, before we go into some of the detail about um, the, the background to why I've decided to uh, propose that we make this presentation. Um, I think uh, the strange thing is that from the outset, the ready-made garment sector um, in Asia understood right from the word go, that uh, using industrial engineering techniques uh, were basically one of the, the foundations of any success that they have. 
So the strange thing is that we visit companies who are uh, vertical, that is, the taking fiber and turning it into garments. And in the garment divisions of those companies, we see uh, armies of industrial engineers. But then in the other parts of their operations, spinning uh, through to dyeing and finishing before garment making, uh, there are no industrial engineers on their staff, uh, which uh, obviously we find a little strange. Um, uh, when I first left the UK, um, which was in 1973, um, I went to work in Turkey. And uh, 40 years ago in Turkey, nobody cared about uh, labor costs because they were in a similar situation to countries like Bangladesh and uh, uh, are now. But today, uh, Turkish mills uh, have some of the highest levels of productivity in their spinning mills in the world. Um, Bangladesh, um, uh, it's very interesting that although labor costs in Bangladesh are very, very low, um, the spinning mills that we've uh, visited in Bangladesh are constantly complaining about how they lose skilled operators to the garment sector, because in the garment sector, you can uh, earn more money because of the overtime opportunities that you get that you don't get in the regular spinning mills. You know, and one of the things I've been saying to some of the mills that we have in Bangladesh is, look, gentlemen, you need to balance your labor force properly so that you can only have the kind of number of people that you want. You can pay them more and then you won't be losing them so often to uh, the, the, the garment sector. Uh, finally, uh, let me talk about China. I first visited China in 1983, and uh, over the years, um, I've done business and bought millions of yards of fabric in, uh, in China. Um, I have a close friend there who uh, runs a weaving mill, and uh, uh, Doris is now offering up to $7 an hour uh, to find weavers, and she can't find people, she tells me. Uh, she says that young people in China, uh, they would prefer to work as a supermarket checkout person and have that social uh, interaction they can have with their fellow citizens rather than work in a mill where, yeah, if you're a spinner or a weaver, an eight-hour shift is hard work and sometimes not in always the best ambient conditions. So uh, I think what uh, my friend is telling me um, uh, is happening in China. Maybe it's already happening in India, I don't know, but if it's not, it will tomorrow. So the focus of the paper today is I'm going to talk about very basic industrial techniques which have been successfully applied in our industry uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, uh, method study, um, really, that's very simple. What it is, is that you're basically looking at how we do things. Uh, you analyze the existing method, and then you question yourself, um, how could we do that better? How could we stop doing uh, work that isn't really uh, necessary? Um, and you can do this uh, method study either on a micro or, or a macro uh, level. Let me give you an example of, in, in practical terms, of how method study is important. If you take repairing a yarn break in spinning, uh, in the mills that we visit, I basically have seen uh, normally two different methods. Either the, the spinner, when the arm breaks, will try and piece it up into the front nip of the front roller, or they will just thread the yarn uh, around the back of the, the first uh, uh, drafting roller. Now, um, uh, those of you who are familiar with the technology will know that those two different methods result in two different sizes of yarn piecing. One of them will be slightly thinner and longer. The other one will be shorter, but fatter. Uh, that has an impact in the clearer, uh, in, in winding. And when uh, there is no standardized method uh, in a mill, then operators will use the one that they find the easiest. But uh, I'm sorry, that's not the way it should be. You should define which of these two methods you prefer, and I have no preference myself, but then once you've decided, it's important that everybody 
follows the same procedure. Um, to do method study, there's lots and lots of t uh, tasks, tools, sorry, that you can find on the uh, on the internet. Uh, that how to use the charts that you need. There are lots of lexicons of the symbols, uh, etc. Uh, there's even details about the uses of of principles of motion economy, etc. But I can tell you, in the world class mills that we visit, method study is constantly undertaken as part of their programs of continuous improvement. Uh, these things are not just one time events. So a method study conducted by a trained industrial engineer should improve the utilization of your assets and resources. Obviously, it should standardize work methods and then improve workflow and workplace uh, layout, reduce excessive material handling, improve productivity, obviously, because that's the objective, but then that will reduce your cost and increase your profitability. So, uh, as I've uh, alluded to previously, in our industry, I've personally experienced the use of method study to successfully reorganize warehousing, maintenance operations, uh, doffing and removing replacement procedures, you know, like block creeling or whatever, warp change and knotting crews in weaving, etc. Uh, extensive use throughout the industry at least in the higher wage cost uh, countries. Uh, once you've established uh, the correct methodology, obviously the next step is to um, uh, divide the activities into elements of work and then uh, time, uh, how long it takes to do those um, uh, pieces of work. So good examples of uh, work elements would be piecing a broken yarn or uh, in uh, ring frames or uh, open end, replacing a roving bobbins or in weaving, repairing warp bricks or weft bricks or whatever. And uh, work and time measurement are used to develop standard times that you need to perform in the various operations. In the ready-made garment sector, this is what standard day-to-day uh, -day procedure. I think in uh, manufacturing, for example, a polo shirt, there's somewhere between 20 and 30 individual operations. And each one of those is identified, uh, times, uh, and then costed in order that you make up the total cost of your, uh, of your, uh, your garments. Um, in the high wage uh, cost countries, uh, the use of uh, individual productivity systems I, uh, you uh, get higher efficiency weaving, you get paid more money, uh, the same thing in spinning. Uh, those have lost favor over, I would say, the last 20, 20 years. Um, they've been replaced uh, by different systems, you know, group bonus systems, measured day rate, etc. But I can tell you from my personal experience, I have never seen spinners and weavers with higher efficiencies than I have seen in mills where uh, people are working with individual productivity uh, systems. Uh, it may be that in some countries uh, that's against the law, but I can tell you there is now a recurring interest in uh, countries like the USA and in Europe about the reintroduction of uh, some of those uh, kind of techniques. Uh, as I said, uh, in this slide, over the last three and a half years, uh, we have not seen individual incentive systems being used in any mills except in some garment factories. So, um, uh, one of the things about time measurement is that a, a, a trained industrial engineer uh, will rate somebody. Uh, that means that he will give a time for an element of work uh, that is achieved with people working at normal uh, pace. Uh, there are synthetic uh, ratings that you can find on the internet, but what happens with the trained industrial engineer, the adjustments are made to the times that he sees so that these time standards are fair. And these adjustments are called allowances. And here on this slide, you can see the kind of thing where allowances are made, for obviously for personal needs, basic and varial fatigue. Fatigue, for example, is a very important factor. 
Um, I've, over the years, I've worked with a number of companies who have decided, for example, when running uh, 24-hour shifts, uh, that, okay, what we'll do is we'll swap from doing uh, three eight-hour shifts in the 24 hours, we'll go to two 12-hour shifts. I, I can tell you personally, I I've done a number of uh, research projects with people where when you monitor the performance of your operatives after the end of an eight-hour shift, up to the end of a 12-hour shift, their performance really, really drops off quite dramatically. And uh, really, in most cases, uh, at least in, in my experience, uh, I never recommend for direct workers like spinners or weavers uh, that they work uh, extended 12-hour shifts. Um, once we've got the time uh, of each element of work and we've got the correct methodology, the next thing is to establish the frequency of how often those elements of work work. Now, um, over the last, what, three and a half years, uh, I've been, uh, despite all the mills I've been in, I've only been in, I think, three mills where I've seen the use of the technology that's available such as Ooster Roving Stop or the Ooster Sentinel. Um, or, or, yes, I see obviously a lot more mills where there is the online process data being uh, uh, enabled from the, from the clearer uh, machines. But in other words, no. And when this frequency is not available directly from the technology you have on the, your machines, then it must be uh, gathered manually via frequency tests. You know, in the majority of mills we visit, regular frequency studies are not included as the essential part of process control that we think they should be. Um, if you think that you can control yarn quality only by doing laboratory testing, I'm sorry, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, uh, that's incorrect. Uh, the nothing identifies off standard quality in ring frames like well constructed frequency studies uh, that are done to a set program. Um, I just want to touch briefly on the subject of interference. Uh, interference is basically what happens. Uh, let's take a ring frame. So uh, I'm working and piecing an end on a ring frame. And while I'm working, doing that work, another end breaks and then another end breaks, and then another end breaks. So what happens? The second end that broke has to wait until I finish working on the first end, walk to the second spindle and repair it. Meanwhile, broken ends three and four are still waiting. The uh, efficiency loss that takes place by that waiting time is really uh, known in the trade as interference. Um, that's because machines do not run continuously throughout a shift. And in our industry, we often have uh, operators running numbers of machines, not just in ring frames and looms, but also in warping machines, in roving machines, in draw frames, et cetera. Um, so the factor of interference uh, is a very, very important factor that needs to be taken into account. Um, so um, as this slide says, it's very important that you have the proper balance between the stops per thousand spindle hours in your ring frames, the time it takes to repair them, and then the efficiency that's being lost through interference. You know, th there is a massive difference when uh, you've got, what, five or, or 10 stops per thousand spindle hours and you're running with 80 or 90 stops per thousand spindle hours how much it affects the machine efficiency uh, and your labor productivity. Uh, I have a classic example. Uh, two years ago, I was in a mill in Bangladesh walking around uh, where the spinners were obviously struggling. Far too many end breaks, very low efficiency. And uh, on the other hand, they probably had three times as many people as they needed in uh, the winding area. Uh, I said to the mill manager, you know, he was saying, what can I do? I don't have any more people to put in the ring frames. I said, yes, you do. Take some of the people out of the winding department, 
uh, uh, retrain them to, to do the work in spinning, you will not lose any efficiency or quality in the winding area. Um, I think today uh, it's very important that, that you have that correct balance. In a high wage uh, cost country, it is pretty more important. But with the high capital cost of, of textile equipment, um, it's a continuous challenge for people who are running mills in places like uh, the US. Um, there's, there is a technique uh, called activity sampling, uh, which helps you to uh, uh, identify lost time in your mills, uh, helps you to identify the efficiency of your uh, non-direct workers, like maintenance people, uh, whatever, um, uh, and it can be used, and I've used it throughout my, my career. Um, you know, uh, when we're talking to mills about efficiency, uh, it's amazing how many mills we visit, and we say, okay, you've got, you're running at 85% efficiency in the ring frames or in the looms, so where's the 15% you're losing coming from? And people don't know. And uh, if you don't know where it's coming from, then you can't fix it. And uh, activity sampling is a great tool uh, to help you to identify uh, those problems. I'll move on because uh, I think I'm going to be uh, running out of time. But there's, uh, if you get a copy of this presentation at the end, uh, you will see um, uh, a number of slides about activity sampling. And obviously with all this kind of stuff, there's lots of information available uh, on the internet. So let me just summarize on uh, my personal thoughts about the uh, cotton spinning in today's environment. It's probably one of the most competitive industries in the world, as far as I'm concerned. I, I very often say to people, if you can survive and prosper in the textile industry, in the primary textile sector, uh, you survive and prosper uh, anywhere. Uh, today, even though there is a massive overcapacity in the world, people are building new spinning mills and not shutting down old capacity. You know, uh, in spinning, we have a raw material that represents probably 70% of our cost over which we have no control. Uh, uh, cotton prices vary depending on what investors are doing. Uh, you know, that's scary to think that our largest cost is uh, not able to control. With development of technology um, in our industry, uh, if you talk to some of the, um, uh, any consultant who, who specializes in this area, they'll be telling that basically um, you need to be having a program of continuous replacement and that really every five to seven years, your machine part uh, becomes uh, uh, out of date. Now, uh, uh, in an industry with that kind of business model, uh, profit margins really are a challenge. Um, uh, we believe that um, education and social development are going to make the challenges of attracting and maintaining stable workforces ever, ever harder uh, in countries like India, where your development is, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, we think to meet these challenges, uh, you need to start rethinking the traditional ways that you've done things and that uh, industrial engineering and the simple techniques that we've talked about today can help you in that challenge for manufacturing excellence. Um, uh, I, I hope that today I've been able to illustrate that there are many opportunities to develop uh, or use basic industrial engineering techniques um, in the spinning industry. Uh, we use these tools daily in our work. And uh, I'm not going to go through the next couple of slides because I talk again about the example I used about the uh, end breaks in ring spinning and how with the wrong labor loadings, you not only get reduced efficiency, but you get higher pneumophil waste and all that stuff. But when you attain a copy of this presentation, if you want it, you'll be able to read that. At, uh, at your leisure. So uh, the conclusion, and you know, uh, uh, many of the modern management tools, in fact, I would say all the modern management tools like Six Sigma 5S, Kaizen, Lean, Total Quality Management, all those things, they all have their work in the foundations of the early pioneers of 
scientific management like uh, Frederick Taylor and Maynard and those guys back in the 20s and 30s. Probably the first uh, attempt at organising a workplace was done in the 18th century by a gentleman called Sir Richard Arkwright, who uh, textile tunes will know was the developer of the first spinning machine. Um, uh, I'm sure that with some of the very sophisticated companies that you have in India, many of the people attending this um, this uh, webinar may already be using uh, techniques well beyond what I've talked about today. But I can tell you, based on my personal experience with CTI over the last four years, you are in a minority. So my objective today has been merely to plant the seed of curiosity about engineering and to embrace how you can embrace new weave ways to improve uh, your operations, make more and better yarn, and ultimately, as you've heard previously, uh, about making more money. So uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope that the uh, the connection stay good all the way through. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. It was a, was a very good presentation. And especially, as you said, that once you have committed cotton, which is 70% of your cost, so what you are left with is the balance 30%. And if with industrial engineering, you know, we can improve on that balance, 30 percent we can, because at the end, all the mills are into making money. So that's the main objective at the end. So we are very rightly pointing. Yeah, they're, they're uh, probably sick of us hearing the user <laughs> phrase about uh, spinning is not about making yarn, it's about making money. No, but that's true. Uh, that's true for every business. And uh, why should it be different for spinning? That way. So we are receiving a lot of questions on the chat box. I can tell you how many of them we have been receiving. So before I actually go into a questionnaire session, I will want to reveal some of the results. And also some of the questions that has come up, I will want to just let them know. But first of all, the studies that we have done, especially the one that Dr. Tosseth has shown, is actually done by an independent consultant. It's not to create any bias or to tell that Indian cotton is not good. All cottons are really good. We are supporting cotton. If you say Cotton US is working very closely with Cotton Associations of India just to promote cotton itself. So this is a very fairly neutral setting. And also to tell you what we have told is also what we have received as a response from the questionnaire. Now I'm going to reveal the responses to the question, how does the quality of US cotton compare to the cotton from other regions of the world? And this is exactly what Dr. Tosseth was mentioning. So almost 72% of the respondents today have said that US cotton quality is better than the cotton from other regions. So this is no different than what our studies are showing. And then US cotton quality is about the same than cotton from other regions. Almost 26% of the respondents have told in this region. And then there are still 3 to 4% of people who think that US cotton is not good. And we will want really want to work with them to make them understand that yes, US cotton is at least a part if they don't think it's good. So, so I think this is a, a you know very encouraging response for all of us. So before I again go to the questionnaire, there are two more polling questions which I want our respondents to respond to today. One is, how likely, uh, so Ganesh, if you can put that uh, uh, on the screen, please. So how likely are you to purchase US cotton in the coming year? The first option is unlikely, you are not likely to purchase at all the US cotton. You are undecided. That's the second option that you are neither likely nor unlikely to buy US cotton, then it's very likely to buy US cotton. And the last option is it is not relevant to you because you are not a fiber consumer yourself. So I will repeat the question for you. How likely are you to purchase US cotton in the next year? The four options are the first option, unlikely. Second option is you are undecided, either likely nor unlikely. Third option is very likely to purchase US cotton. And the last option is it's not relevant to me because we don't use the fiber directly. So this was the first question. So we'll wait for your responses on this before we go to the next final polling question for you to participate. And okay. So now this is really important for all of us here at the Cotton USA Solutions. And this is really very important question for us to understand from you. This is how likely, so Ganesh, if you can put the final question on the screen, please. <coughs> So how likely is your organization to utilize the Cotton USA solution offerings? So I'll repeat the question. How likely is your organization to utilize the Cotton USA solution offerings? The first option is very likely. Second option is unlikely. 
Third is you might still need more information because uh, we still need to inform you more about ourselves. And then probably the last option is not relevant to you because you are not a user of Finder or USC. So if you can please respond to this question before we move to the Q&A. And uh, I will also in the meantime request my colleague uh, Ganesh to uh, give us the responses and the results before we go to the questionnaire. So I think I'll wait for the responses and before, uh, while we wait, I think we'll, I'll go to a very first question. We have lot many questions today and I'm sure that we don't have enough time to respond to all of them, but we will try to respond because there are, I think, more than 35 to 40 questions which we already see on the screen. So let's go with our very first question. And I, this is for our first panel member, Chris. So Chris, if you can please respond to this query. And the query is, uh, we have heard that the US cotton has a better uniformity. So what is the real reason that US cotton is having better uniformity? Is it because it's having a better writing period? So what is your opinion based on this question? Okay. When, when, when the, um, when the gentleman or lady speaks about uniformity, I assume that uniformity that they mean uniformity index, and uniformity index is less related to the effects during during the uh, the growing season, but much more related to to the effects of of ginning, because UI uniformity index with U.S. cottons is very highly correlated with short fiber content. And with the things that are going on in the United States with ginning and the awareness that has been created among, amongst ginners of how to gently process cotton, of course, that uniformity index has come down over the last 20 years, actually. It has increased very much and I can attribute it, 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 it less to, to, to the maturing or the growing season effects than to progress that has been made in ginning. So thank you, Chris, for that response. And before we go to our next question, I already have the results from the question that we have asked our uh, participants. So the first question that we asked, how likely are you to purchase US cotton the next year? Almost 56% of the respondents are not using the fiber by themselves, so they did not respond. So, so uh, uh, the balance that we have as a response is that almost 32% of the respondents are very likely to buy U.S. cotton, so this is very good news for us. And there are only 5% respondents who say that they are unlikely to buy U.S. cotton, and there are 19% respondents who say they are neither likely or unlikely. So, so this is good news uh, for all of us here that we have a majority of people who are willing uh, and buy US cotton. And now for our team as well. So the other question was how likely is our is their organization to utilize the cotton USA offerings? So 29% uh, of them have told that they are very likely to use the cotton USA solutions offering. And uh, almost 5% said that they are unlikely and 33% said they need more information about it. So I think we have large proportion of respondents. So I think you guys are going to be very busy in India. Maybe not now, but yes, in the coming months very soon. So so let's go to, yes, Roger. I was about to say, we hope so. <laughs> yes. We love coming to India. <laughs> yes, hopefully COVID uh, should get down and, uh, you know, the time is true. to us. Yes. It's true. Okay. Hopefully yes. soon. Hopefully soon. Yes, please. I'd like to, like to visit with all of you guys. Really. We are waiting also as well. So let's go to our next yes, question. In the past. <laughs> yes. And the other question again is for you, Chris. Uh, and the question is, I think this is a very important question because it says, is it that the gin code is very important while deciding the lay down mixing? That <laughs> that is a very, very good <laughs> question. And um first of all. Let me say that I, 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 I caution everybody against doing that, and here's the reason. Now, in the U.S., there are slightly less than 600 gins. It's like 575, and there are 
several thousand cotton farmers, Roger may know the number, it's a five digit number, like 12,000 or something like that. So what is happening in the US is that seed cotton travels from state to state to be ginned. For example, from Oklahoma to Texas or from Texas to Oklahoma. So gin code does not tell you where the cotton is from. There is no guarantee. Second thing is, even with the same gin code, farmers in the US are using different cotton seed varieties, you know, as they please due to differences in, 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 in the soil and, and their, their machinery. So even the var varieties arriving at the same gin are not, might be different, might be different. So gin code, again, doesn't tell you about the true origin and doesn't tell you about the true varieties. I can exactly see the rationale behind this question, but I think it doesn't work. And then again, even if, even if you decide the gin code consistent in your laydowns, if you add any other percentage of cotton, say Australian, whatever, you have no info whatsoever on the gin code. So it's a um, it's a thing that is sort of undetermined. I can I can only caution against it. I can. But I can advocate spinners to go for the HVI values because that, that is the, the, the true objective basis of describing fiber quality, irrespective of field, origin, time of harvest, and so forth, all these things. Thank you, Chris. And uh, now we go to our uh, next uh, question. And the next question I'll say is for uh, Dr. Tosif. So, Dr. Tosif, we have a couple of questions, and I will probably put two or three questions all together, and maybe then you know you can respond to those. So, first question that has come up today is that uh, what is the mic range that we have uh, uh, studied in our trials? The presentation that you have shown today. What are the kind of mic ranges that we have in those trials? The mic range. So, when we selected these four cottons, so we made sure they are in a narrow range. So they are comparis They are they are comparable, not only in terms of mic, but also in in kind of other parameters as as well. And I don't remember the exact values on the top of my head, but if we look at, for example, Shanko was four point three four, uh, West African four point one, uh, U.S. cotton four point seven three. And Brazilian called quarter one five, and similarly other values. So it's a, as Chris mentioned that it's not only Mike; it's all parameters plus B R D majority, all the parameters which are very very important from our perspective. So consultant made sure that the fibers are comparable. So we are we are making meaningful, meaningful comparisons. And I also like to add that we had over 100 pages of data. So it's a lot of data from all the processes. I love lecturing. If you give me two hours, I'll, I'll give you much more details and data, but we only had 20 minutes. So, uh, but it was done by third party consultants and any study has constraints, but we try to stay as close as possible in terms of parameters. Thank you very much. And uh, so Dr. Tosib, uh, you know, there is a general perception in India and you know, if you can help with that uh, question, one is that most of the spinners in India believe that you know U.S. cotton is mainly good for the light shades or for the whites, and uh, you know they are sometimes reluctant to use it for the dyed shades, right? I mean, for a, for a deep dyed shades. And uh, so, uh, what we want to understand from you is two things. One is how U.S. cotton can be used for the deep color shades, and then. Uh, in, the, in your study, uh, study that you've shown today, have you studied the barriness problem in the dyed fabrics in different cottons? Maybe you can throw your, the light on these two questions. I think first of all, in terms of the of the dyeing of of the shades, as you've seen in the results, so we dyed all four cottons by by a similar approach, by a similar met, methodology. 
And if you look at the color differences, so delta E, so they were all values for insignificant dif differences. So this is for a difficult to dye navy shade or red shade. So we can see that differences are very small, so they can dye very well. As a general principle, I would say, because depending on any cotton fiber, all cotton fibers have different kind of uh, structural level details. So they have different level of crystallinity, different level of amorphous regions. So they would behave differently to the dye. So usually it would make sense for any cotton, whether Indian, uh, Brazilian, US cotton, it's always important to get your recipe right for the dyeing purpose. If you, if you try to use the same recipe for every cotton, it might not work in the same way. So it's important to optimize your dye, dyeing recipe. And also I think uh, ask Chris, because from the fiber selection perspective, what are your thoughts, Chris, on the, on the dyeing? Uh, yes, thanks, Tosif. Um, if we if we talk about um, cotton fiber dyeing, the factor that is at work here is fiber maturity, or in simple terms, the the amount of cellulose present in the fiber cell wall. And incidentally, the maturity highly is highly correlated to the micron error. So the key, the, the true key to avoiding any dying and white specs problems is to, is to source higher micron error cottons. What I tell people is to stay away from, from any bales of 4.2 mic or lower and to build a certain safety margin, I'd say, stay away from anything below 4.4. And I almost guarantee you're not going to have any barre, any dye streaks, any white specks problems. And the good news is that the average micron air of, of, of US cotton over almost, I believe 20 years is 4.5. So, it, if you as a spinner would maintain that 4.5 mic, you're pretty much on the safe side. Now, what is the reason for you to, to go below average? You know, who or what in life would you want to be below average? US average is 4.5. And if you buy 4.6, 4.7 average with, with, with the, the restriction to not use anything below 4.4, I believe you're absolutely safe in terms of white specs and RA. I would just like to add, Chris, US cotton is the only cotton where you get properties parameters for every single bale. That, so, so you can that, easily make your selection. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. Thank you, Tosset. Roger, please go ahead. You want to add something? Yeah, please, I, I just wanted to add that, um, as uh, Tausif said earlier, with any uh, different cotton that you're using, you're always going to have to look at the recipe and make some minor adjustments. But if our uh, people joining, if they go on the cotton.org website, they will see a number of studies done by independent consultants that show that from a financial point of view, the minor adjustments that may have to be made to recipes have no impact whatsoever on, on the cost of dying. None whatsoever. Thank you, Roger. So there is another question again on the micro I think we can spend a lot of time on micro -near. So uh, <laughs> somebody has asked what, what micro is recommended for 20s open and denim quality for idea. For 20s open end, said yeah, again. 20s open end, uh, yarn for the denim quality. 20s open end for denim. Yes. What is the again, micro on here? Again. What are your well, suggestions? Well, denim weaving, um, not much of a problem in terms of um, in terms of dyeing. So for um, for maximum um, running performance, I would say. Average 4.2 micron air. Avoid anything below 3.8. Take it up to wherever you want. 
And 4.2 for 20s, you should be fine with an open end, yes. Again, number of fibers in the cross section is, is, is the thing here. I, I would rather recommend 4.6, 4.8 micron air, but that's too much in terms of the intrinsic fineness of the fibers and, 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 and too much in terms of the, um, or too less, I should say, in terms of the number of fibers per, 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 per cross section for open end spinning. Thanks. So now we move the question from 70% to 30%, which means we now need Roger to respond on this. So Roger, we have a question for this specific, <laughs> specifically for you. Uh, somebody has asked, what is the role of the worker now? Because they say for a 100,000 spindle mill with an average count of 70s, they only have 250 operators, including all the three shifts. So how do you really see the role of workers now as we move forward? Uh, well, first of all, the number that they've quoted, if that's their mill, congratulations. <laughs> but that's not the numbers that we see around the world. Uh, I can tell you, um, in uh, and unfortunately, in the last three years, uh, I've not had the opportunity uh, to visit that many Indian mills personally. And I know that in terms of industrial engineering, I think uh, the Indian companies are quite far ahead in comparison with their neighbors in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, all those places. Uh, but yeah, the role of the worker is important, obviously. You can't, we can't do without them. We shouldn't do without them. Uh, but as I, I think uh, uh, social development will take place, as I said, uh, there's going to be a renewed emphasis on looking at how you can get the most out of uh, out of your people. Uh, uh, pay them fairly, uh, give them good wages. You know, uh, as I was, I think I said, this is not a great industry for attracting people, particularly now. You know, when they can spend all day on the internet and what talking to their friends with TikTok and whatever. You know, uh, running around chasing uh, uh, stops on ring frames for eight hours in a temperature of, what, 35 degrees and with relative humidity. Oh, what is, uh, there are a lot better ways for people to, to, spend their, to spend their time from that point of view. So I think there has to be a more focus on using these techniques to make working life better for the workers that we have so that we keep them. Yeah, I think we still I have lot. The answers. Uh, I think we still have lot many questions, you know, that we need to respond. But because of the time constraint, mm -hmm. I think we can take another three questions to respond. Uh, so one of the questions I think have been asked is again uh, about Dr. Koss's study. He, uh, so the guys have asked that different fibers demand different process conditions and parameters to be tuned accordingly. So while doing that study. Was that, kept, was that kept in mind when we did that comparative study on the NEPS? So Dr. Tosuk, over to you on this. I think if we, if, we had, if we had cottons which were not comparable in parameters, I think it would have been unfair to process them through the same process detail. Because cottons were very comparable, the four cotton. So we kept it as a constant. So the number of variable as you increase, so we kept the cotton selection as close as possible. And then the individual uh, processes during manufacturing were then, uh, were then kept the same. So uh, throughout spinning, knitting, uh, tying, and then covered the manufacturing. Thank you. So I think the next question is, uh, uh, you know, this has actually now uh, come from uh, one of the leading home textile mill in India. They are asking that they are receiving a lot of questions on the traceability. So is U.S. cotton doing anything on the traceability uh, part of uh, part of it? So anybody on the panel wants to respond on that? Yeah, I or can. Uh, I can respond. Yeah, yeah. To I think I think that well. should be uh, Roger's oh, oh, job. Oh, sorry, Chris can as well. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> He's pointing to you. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, CCI have been working very closely with a company called uh, Oratain over the last uh, few years. Uh, we've done a project where basically uh, using the Oritane technology, uh, we can al almost tell you um, which field <laughs> a particular cotton came from, 
from the uh, from the uh, the garment that you're looking at. Um, as part of the U.S. Uh, protocol, trust protocol, uh, traceability is now intimately linked into uh, uh, the trust protocol. And again, I think if uh, people go on the trust protocol website, they can see how uh, CCI have used the technology that's available uh, uh, with regard to, to traceability. Yeah. I will also now add to what Roger has just told about U.S. cotton trust protocol trackability. We have this unique management system to track the U.S. cotton. And somebody who is already a member of U.S. cotton trust protocol, we are actually now in the process to update them, giving them a you know a detailed presentation of how U.S. cotton is using the cloud chain technology also to uh, give that uh, you know level of trackability so that they can give all the right kind of insurances to the brand. So so thanks, Roger, uh, to take that question. And uh, one question, which I think is a general question, again, you know, talking of the profitability from, from the top level, uh, it is like, in, all of us know what happened in 2010. So the cotton had become white gold, then the cotton prices have shot up, yarn prices gone up again. And this time again, we are seeing the yarn prices have skyrocketed. So uh, do you think we are going to see the similar kind of times that we have seen in 2010, 2011, when the cotton yarn prices skyrocketed? Do you think, or do you think it's only momentary and momentary uh, phenomena, and uh, things will be in equilibrium very soon? So, what are you? What is your take on this, gentlemen? Uh, I I uh, I would make one opening statement. Um, if I could uh, forecast uh, what cotton prices were going to do at the age of seventy-six, I wouldn't be spending my time uh, on a window hour. I'd yes. be on a yacht somewhere smoking a large yes. cigar. But yes. Um, yes. having yes. Uh, having said that, up, <laughs> having said that up front, I think the uh, I think the circumstances that led to uh, two dollar a pound cotton in two thousand eleven, I think it was, um, that was a perfect storm. Um, I don't think uh, we're going to see that now. I say one of the problems with cotton prices is that. It gets influenced not only by what's going on in the industry, but it gets influenced by investors. You know, um, I, I lived in America. Yeah, speculation. Speculation. Use the I, term I lived, speculation. I, yeah, I lived for 30 years in America. And uh, I can tell you, uh, around uh, March or April every year, all the doctors and dentists who have been uh, speculating in the cotton market suddenly all wanted to get out because it was the end of the tax year. Um, you know, the, there are outside influences that impact on cotton price. They have nothing. I think uh, the Rogers connection uh, is, is stuck a little bit. Yeah, so, so I think you'll have to excuse a little bit. So I think final question is there before, you know, we really close our session today is, uh, this is really technical for me even to ask this question, but I will, uh, you know, just pose it to you. So somebody has asked how yarn CVs, RKM, elongation, and HCV can be controlled, and can this be achieved up to twenty percent USP? Should I repeat my question, or it's understandable, you guys? Repeat it, please. Okay. How yarn CVs, RKM, elongation, and CV can be controlled? And can this be achieved up to 25% USP? Well, yarn quality, in terms of what um, the lady or the gentleman asking the question has raised, is, is, is I mean, it's totally governed by cotton quality, really. And the machines used if they're a year old or five year years old or 20 really doesn't matter you can you can make work class yarn with these machines um but you have to use world class cotton okay and my recommendation is to use to use us cotton and 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 selecting selecting the right HBI properties and managing laydowns 
um, I'm talking about bail management here, is, 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 is a guarantee of achieving the best values in this regard. And if we're talking about RKM and uniformity and API and so forth. So please, please US cotton, use US cotton, but use it as you can easily do with the HVI bail management um, measurements, use it in conjunction with some form of bail management to guarantee the very best yarn quality. Thank you, Chris. And I think the following question, which is will be the final question for us today, is again a following question to this is is there any specific parameter in the US mod or you call US supplement button that you have to achieve this uh, you know yarn RKM CV percentage? Any specific parameter you will want to highlight in the US supplement pattern in order to maintain this yarn quality that you just spoke about? RKM and CV? Yes. Okay. Any specific the most, parameter? The most, the most underrated thing about US cotton HVI properties is probably uniformity index. And I mentioned that <clears throat> during my presentation. It has a it has a wonderful correlation with a short fiber content. And I think we all can agree that short fiber content is, is responsible, responsible to a large extent for um, RKM uniformity, yarn uniformity, and, and imperfections. So I would I would my suggestion would be to go for US cotton with high uniformity index. I mean higher than 83 if possible. And you, if 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 you look at if you look at the um, the famous um, formulae for formula for spinning consistency index, and you, if you look at the effect of uniformity index that has in that formula, I mean it's outstanding. So my secret advice is go for high UI eighty three and higher, which means lower short fiber content with the US cottons, and you'll get a lot more arcane uniformity and lower API. UI stands for short fiber content directly with US cottons. Thanks, Chris. So we got that secret out from you, finally. <laughs> so yeah, so that's that's the almost the end of the question and answer session, because if we carry on, we are going to have a lot many questions, because I think this was a wonderful session, uh -huh. gentlemen. And uh, I'm sure you will want to be back because we still have so many questions, you know, which aren't responded, and probably we will want to respond them when we have a next, uh, you know, series of webinar again. So once again, uh, you know, very thankful to our speakers, to our participants, and to our organizers uh, to be with us today throughout the session. And we hope we can do this in person soon. I mean, if the COVID will allow us. Because yes. I mean, Chris wants to come. Everybody really wants to come. And yeah, to I, I really. <laughs> Yes. So all fingers we, crossed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We hope yeah. we can. We hope we can really do that. And until then, I can promise that we will continue to do this, uh, you know, webinar so that we stay close to you. And one thing before I really close is I want to, you know, uh, clear the perception is that we do not promote any specific machinery manufacturer because I could see one question in the chat: Are we promoting booster in particularly? No. So we, it's not that we are promoting any specific machinery manufacturer no. because we are a non-profit organization, so we don't really promote. So whatever best new technology we can get from any of the machine manufacturers per se, because we really believe in innovation. So we'll continue to do that. It's not that we are, you know, uh, you know, lined up for a specific machine manufacturer. So no, it's not that we are, you know, hooked up to any one specific manufacturer. So I think with this, uh, you know, once again, I thank you everyone to be with us today. And I hope you can really stay safe. And we hope we this, this will also pass through. And uh, now uh, I will pass on to Ganesh. So, Thank you very much once again, and now over to you. Thank you. One more thing. Go ahead. Please stay safe and healthy, everybody. All right. We come to the end of this uh, thought-provoking webinar. I thank everyone for attending today's session. I thank all our speakers, Mr. Chris Faber, Mr. Mohammed Tosif, Mr. Roger Gilmartin, and a very special thanks to Piyush Narang and his team, with whom we worked very closely for the last couple of weeks to make this section a grand success. See you all in our next webinar. So until then, stay safe, stay tuned.
This is Ganesh Kalidasan signing out. Bye-bye.